You know, sometimes in life there's a request or desire within us to be good at something, to be great at something. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be a master of certain skills and talents, certain proficiencies? It would be wonderful to have this sense that you've honed your craft enough that you're called a master or an expert at it. It would really be good to be maybe as talented as Scott is on the piano. To play the piano like that, to be that proficient would be wonderful. To cook like Martha Tanner or Mimi and to have that kind of skill where we can really create all kinds of wonderful food. Looking forward to next Sunday in particular. We're looking for those master skills that people have that we want to share maybe in gardening like some of you do, and I've seen your beautiful yards and all the flowers you do. Joanne and Connie are big into gardening. They love it so much. Maybe you'd like to be a master painter. Brenda is an artist, and she painted a beautiful painting of me. Uh, I have to say it's beautiful because that's her skill in artwork, and she's created this wonderful um, painting capturing the, the Spirit of God uh, dwelling in me and around me, and I just love it. I have it in my office. I appreciate that. Masters. Skilled people, talented, we have them all around us. And in life, we desire to somehow be uh, a skilled person or to have some sort of talent that we refined. And there are some that are very important, some really important skills. But there is one, one thing that we're called to be masters at. One thing that's really important above all the others that are creative, building and uh, that allow us to manifest or bring about something wonderful. It is this, to be the master at love. Love. That's right. This weekend is Valentine's weekend, and we want so uh, much for you to experience the power of love within your life. Many people will say, Valentine's, well, whatever. I don't have that sweetie. I don't have that special one in my life right now. But you know what? It's all about the season of acknowledging love sharing love, imparting love, bringing love to uh, forward within our hearts and our lives. That's the spirit of St. Valentine, who was one who spoke of love in beautiful ways beyond just the romantic side, calling us to demonstrate love within our hearts and our lives, to be good at it, to hone the craft of loving, to say, this is what I desire to be a master at. I want to be proficient. I want to be good at loving. Now, how do we get good at anything? You know, well, practice, 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 practice. That's exactly what we need to do. So it is important that we engage in spiritual practice, that that's which opens the doors for us understanding the power of love, love within us, through us, around us, and flowing for us at all times. So we begin with a spiritual practice that's centered all about love and discovering its transformational power within our lives. Love, to practice it. Love, to engage in it. Love, to hone the craft of sharing and giving it is so transformational for our lives. We have a beautiful story within Scripture that it sort of symbolizes the power of a transformation of one who's practiced a spiritual practice, one who has embodied a spiritual practice that unfolded a greater understanding of love. We find the story of Saul of Tarsus. If you're not familiar with the story, let's just pretend that we are now traveling back in time, and we are there in the biblical lands, and we are there to discover Saul of Tarsus is the great persecutor of all people of the way. That's right. The early believers, followers of Jesus, were called people of the way. They weren't referred to as Christians. That came years, years later. But Jesus offered a way, a teaching. So they were people of the teaching, people of the way, just like you and I were people of the way, people of this wonderful, powerful teaching that we want to live out each and every day in our lives. Saul of Tarsus, being a religious Jew, sort of the fundamentalist, of the day and age, that person who would look at the specifically in the black and white context, stood out as a persecutor of those people who began to embrace this wonderful teaching of a power within their lives, of a practice that is engaging, that was transformational. He began to stand up against it and wanted to persecute, stop it in any way, and rode off to Damascus on his horse hoping to arrest those people who proclaim to be of this teaching. 
and Damascus, if you've ever been to Israel or know anything about the terrain, you notice that Damascus is in this area where there's a high elevation. And in the afternoon, it's known for thunderstorms and strikes of strikes of lightning. Paul is riding his, or Saul is riding his horse, and he is struck by lightning. He's struck by this wonderful light. We don't know if it's literal or if it's metaphorical, but we can take either one. And he falls off his high horse. Literally, that's right. This proud, arrogant man who went about trying to persecute now is humbled and falling on the ground and is blinded by the light. This transformational experience shatters that persecution pride that was so strong within him and begins to bring about a change as the Spirit of God is teaching and speaking. The very revelation of Jesus, the Christ found there as the Scriptures unfold to say was speaking and teaching him. And as days went on, he began to experience this incredible change. Now in the story, we find Saul now is named Paul. Because whenever there's these wonderful, powerful transitions in someone's life, there's a name change. We've seen that all through the Old Testament and in the New. We find those people have experienced some sort of transition and change within their life that says, as names spoke of a character, so it is that it required a change in name because I have a newfound character. Behold, you've got a new name. And how wonderful that is when we think about that. I have a new name written down in glory. How many of you ever heard that phrase from Scripture? Maybe you've sung that song or chorus in an old time uh, camp meeting or revival from a previous spiritual background, uh, that new name that's given to us speaks of this newfound transitional character that's deep within you that you've awakened to. And Saul has now become Paul as he speaks of a new way of living. Now, what a transition, because you think about this man who was so angry and so filled with religious arrogance that he wanted to persecute and see people suffer who didn't believe or think the way he did. Wow, we've got a few Saul's in our world today, don't we? Around us where people say, you don't think like I do? Well, I'm going to make sure that you suffer. I'm going to accuse. I'm going to make accusations about you. I want to see that your life difficult. And I'm going to tell you how many times I believe you are wrong. Here's a man who was so filled with this attitude, this arrogance within him. And suddenly we find throughout Scripture, he's the one who writes. The love chapter, the chapter on love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you may have heard it read at wedding ceremonies, moments of celebration, anniversaries of love. People love this beautiful passage. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a clanging gong or a clanging cymbal. Wow, what poetic words to describe. I'm just noise, harsh. If I don't have love. Wow, he could write this? What a transformation within his life. He writes, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. And whoa, it's not proud. Wait a minute. Proud Saul, arrogant Saul, is writing about love being not proud or boastful. What happened within his life that was such a transformation that changed him, that he could write so poetically about this divine love that was rising up within him? We find he writes even more so that he says, love does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And I love this. He writes, love never fails. It had to be an amazing transition in his life for him to be able to describe love, the beauty of love, God, who is love, love within his life unfolding in a powerful way. We find that not only did he have this experience on the road to Damascus, where his life is so transformed, but we find that what he did was he went away after this experience into the wilderness. We find in Scripture a lot of times this beautiful metaphoric symbol of going away to a desert, going away to a wilderness, going to wait this time of solitude and being alone to work on that which we know to be our truth. 
how important it is that we found our own places where we've gone to the wilderness, we've gone to our own deserts, we've gone to our own places where we say, wait a minute, what do I know and how do I believe and what is it I really embrace in my heart and life and what is it that I really want to live out and how do I do all of this? You see, in that wilderness environment, there's where Saul began to work through and I believe the spirit began to teach and unfold for him and to hone the craft of love. To hone the craft of loving. To be one who is so transformed by the power of this divine love in him that it began to work through him, that it began to be around him, that it began to be for him in all ways, and then before for all that he encountered. And everyone who experienced Saul now is beginning to experience this transformation, this wonderful power within his life. He was a changed man a transformation due to a spiritual practice of seeking to learn what is love? What is love? And how does it unfold? Who is love? And how is this love working within me? And began to seek this with a desire to learn and to experience more because that's what it takes in each one of our lives is a spiritual practice of saying, I want to learn. I want to practice this until I become good at it. He went away in a way to, uh, to find a place where he might be refined within himself. An expert who writes so beautifully and eloquently about the command that Jesus has offered us, the suggestion, the guidance, the direction. Beloved, love one another. Beloved, love one another. So today, let's talk about some spiritual practices that we might engage in that help us to grow our own spiritual life. That when we go to this place of solitude, our own personal desert, our own wilderness, away from all the hubbub of life, that we might allow this spiritual practice that we engage in to refine us, that we become masters at love. Let's get good at this. Amen? Let's get good at love. Let's get good at demonstrating it, sharing it, giving it, allowing it to be flowing within us, allowing us to receive it and open up our lives to it in greater ways than ever before. Let's get good at it. So the first thing let me suggest to you is that we need to pray over our spiritual growth. You know, each and every one of us may feel that, you know, it's our intent to love. And we understand that, that people of faith, people of spirituality, people of truth, they love. But just because that's our intent doesn't mean that we're really good at it. You know? A lot of times we step out and we just haven't learned how to be good at this. Because we need to learn this fine art. We need to say, I want to be good at loving. I want to grow in such a way. So let me first begin to pray about my spiritual growth. Pray about it. And begin to do it in the affirmative that say, I claim now, I affirm now that right now in this moment, I am growing in the understanding of love. I am growing in the experience of love within me. I am growing in such a way that I'm allowing this love to manifest through me to others that they may see this wonderful uh, spirit of the divine at work within me. That's right. When you walk into a room, it should be so that what do they say to you? Hello, love. That's right. In the old English way, hello, love. Hello, love. Oh, good to see you, love. Love. Oh, wonderful. Good to see you. But wouldn't that be wonderful if that's the way the world looked at each and every one of us? Because we had practiced it. We've honed the art. We now were known as love. Hello, love. You've walked into the room. Hello, love. I feel you. Hello, love. I feel you in this wonderful experience. I am in this wonderful encounter with love because you're here. And we prayed about our spiritual growth because we need to grow to hear this divine presence speaking to us. That's right. Love speaks. Love wants to lead. Love wants to guide. Love wants to direct. And love wants to speak to us at all times. I love that promise. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge God and God will direct your paths. I love to say, and love will direct your paths. For God is love. 
when we trust, we know that love is directing. Love is the one guiding. Love is the one speaking. Say, go here, go there. Don't say that. Do say this. Think twice. Act this way. Don't act that way. Think twice about what you're doing and how you're living out your life. Let your light so shine. You see the spirit of love is ever wanting to speak to us as we begin to pray and say, God, I want so much more. I seek so much more. I desire so much more within my life. So I invite you to join with me in this affirming prayer and repeat after me. Would you please? I am growing to be one who loves like God. I am growing to be one who loves like God. I see myself as a vessel for divine love to be poured out on others. I know that all I need is within me. I am filled with patience. Maybe we got to say that again. I am filled with patience and kindness. I am ready to release all that I need. I am open to loving in ways that celebrates truth. Wow. We've just affirmed. We've just spoken a affirmative prayer that that's our desire, that our spiritual growth might be led and guided in this way, that it unfolds in such a way that there's a transformation within our lives. Second spiritual practice I want to bring out is that it's important that we practice centering ourselves in our true nature, our true nature, not the nature of this physical world around us, but the spiritual nature of that which you've been created in. You know, you're created as the image and likeness of the divine, the divine, which is love. You're created in the image and likeness of love. That's right. We should be seeing love, experiencing love as we walk and live in this wonderful awareness of our true nature, of who we are. Because loving is so important. It's a guideline for our success in life, and it's also a guarantee of success in our life. John chapter 13, 34 through 35 shares this. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you might uh, must love one another in this way. By all this, men and women will know that you are my disciples. If, if, if you love one another. That's the key. You see, here's the beautiful thing is to love one another in the way that I have loved you. And we need to see uh, examples in our life of people loving constantly. We need to see role models brought before us, people who are demonstrating love, that we might learn how to hone the craft, be more proficient, be better at loving. We need to see examples, right? And the writer, the Apostle Paul is writing here, you know, beloved, love one another. I've loved you, and as I've loved you in an exemplary way, begin to love. Love others that way. You're called to be an example of love for this world. Now, God is love, and how is God revealed? Through each and every one of us. What kind of job are you doing at revealing God? How good are you being at that? Are you being the best revelation, the best light, the best example? Because the world is looking around saying, I need an example. I need to know how to love. Show me how to love. Show me how to do this. How do you love in this circumstance? How do you love in this chaotic world? How do you love when people don't love you? How do you love in a world where people are antagonistic and full of drama and chaos? How do you love? I need an example. And that's who we're called to be. After all, it's your signature look. That's right. As people of the way, you have a signature look. And your look is the look of love. The look of love is your sig. Yeah, like you're wearing Gucci or Prada, or you're wearing J.C. Penney's, or you're wearing a Target, or something like that. whatever it may be. You have a signature look. You've got a label, uh huh. And we start quite often like to say, "Oh yes, mm -hmm. this, yeah, Armani." Uh huh. Not really, uh, but you know, we like to see we've got some sort of label, some sort of signature that says, "This is who we are." Well, let me tell you this: your label is L O V E. It's the signature that says, oh, 
I just experienced a person of the way, a person of the teaching, a person who lives with practical spiritual truth. I just heard of someone who's a new thought believer because they are just walked into the room and I just felt, whoa, 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 radiating love, vibrational love, frequency of love coming at me. Just love as if I was this wonderful uh, meditation singing bowl offering this great vibration, this frequency. It's my signature look. It's my signature. For by this they shall know. You are my disciples. By this love, this signature, this sign, this evidence, they'll know that you are followers, believers, people who practice what they believe. You see how important that is that we have this because this love is meant to flow through us. But sometimes when we lose touch with the divine presence, which is love, well, we end up living in the less than, that human love, not the divine love. That human love that has error about it, that sort of misses the mark, you know? That human love that goes so far and drops off, that human love that may have some limitations to it, that human love that has all kinds of shortcomings to it. And so we find that we're not so good at loving when we've moved away from this true essence of who we are and centered in that we are the child of God. So often you may find it hard to love someone. You know, someone walks into your life, someone you encounter, work, social life, family, whatever it may be, certainly not in church, but somebody that you don't love, you're saying, oh, it's hard to love this person because, and you, what happens is in this human love, this, where we stepped out of the awareness of our true divine nature and who we are, and this stepped away from this divine love, what happens is we get our feelings hurt. Mm hmm we become more needy. Oh, oh, because suddenly we're like, I need you. Did you compliment me today? Did you say something nice to me? I need you. I'm just like, <sighs> you know, those energy vampires that we have in the world that just want to suck all the energy off of us. I need because I got nothing to give because I'm just will moving and operating in the human love world. I don't understand the divine nature within me that is an outburst of love, but I'm like wanting to suck up all the love from everyone else. And what we find is that when we've moved away from divine love, we're less joyful. We're not as happy. We're not as joyful about the loving experience. You know, we kind of got this, yeah, yeah, sure, I love you. Yeah, whatever, you know. We're that kind of love person, you know. Instead of like, I love you. I'm opening up to the love, as we sang. I'm opening up my arms wide. I am ready to receive. I am ready to give because I have the divine Love of God on fire at work within me, unfolding within me. I'm aware of my true nature. That true nature, the spark of the divine within me. God alive within me. I'm aware of that. I'm filled with this love. And I've got so much, it's percolating, it's bubbling up, it's flowing out. It's like an explosive volcano that just wants to spread love everywhere I go. You see, that's the big difference when we've spent time in a spiritual practice that's centered on this I know to be my truth. I'm a child of God. And divine love is what I'm created in. And divine love is where I reside. So join with me in this affirmative prayer. Would you repeat after me? Right now, I am centered in God's love. I'm allowing it to flow freely. I open the eyes of my heart. I see in a new way. Divine love flowing in me. Flowing through me. Flowing around me. And ever for me. Wow, what a powerful affirmation that is. As we work on these spiritual practices within our lives, we find that there's all kinds of transformation power at work within us. We're realizing we need to pray for our spiritual growth. We realize that we need to pray and, and concentrate and focus on our true nature. And once in a while, you need to check in on your soul. That's right. You know, we get so busy sometimes in life. When's the last time you did a little soul check in? Soul, how are you doing? You know, kind of have a little conversation with that soul, that inner spirit within you. 
When's the last time you did a little check-in and said, you know, I just want to check and see how you're doing, soul. You okay? You hanging in there? All right. Are you being nurtured? Are you being cared for? Are you being loved? Are you being strengthened? Are you being re uh, renewed? Because this is so important. When we find in the journey of our life these emotional responses that we have, outbursts, temper tantrums, moments when someone's pushed our buttons, when we want to explode, the short views in our life, those irritated moments where we get like we want to tell people something other than Christian words. Uh, you know those words. I'm, I don't know what those may be, but you know what they are. Uh, these emotional responses within our life, what are they doing? They're communicating something's going on in you. We need to check in. What's going on? What's going on in me? I need to check in with my soul. Why am I irritated? Why am I put off? Why am I feeling hurt? Why am I feeling unloved? Why am I feeling this way? Have I checked in with my soul and say, what's going on, soul? Have I been taking care of you? Have I been really working with you? Because if you're short with others, if you're angry, if you're tense, if you're curt, you got to sift through those things that you're dealing with. You know, I got to get rid of some inflammatory baggage. That's right. Baggage. That's where it's time to deal with it. That inflammatory, that baggage that wants to flare up, that wants to explode, that wants to expand, that wants to blow up. That's right. Some of us are carrying baggage with bombs in them, and we haven't had a spiritual TSA check us out and say, wait a minute, you're not going on this flight today. Uh-uh, you need to get rid of that bomb. We're not going to let you board this journey of faith at all because you're carrying some inflammatory baggage with you. Well, that's what it's all about. We do a spiritual practice of checking in, and we ask ourselves, how am I caring today for my spiritual life? And I'll add my physical body. Because sometimes you wear your body down. And then you wonder why you're irritable. Well, you haven't had some good rest. Rest for the body is also rest for the soul. So join with me in this affirmative prayer. Repeat after me as we pray about this spiritual practice of doing a little soul check-in. Repeat after me, please. I am open to being more aware of my issues. My issues, not your issues. My issues, issues that hamper my ability to love those around me. I am taking responsibility for them right now. And I allow the Spirit to show me how to grow past them. Amen. This is a spiritual work that we need to do within our life. And there's one more that's really important as a spiritual practice. If we're going to be good at love, if we're going to be really proficient at love, if we're going to be masters of love, if we're going to be the love that lights up the world, well, there's something really important that we need to engage in as spiritual practice, and that is work on forgiveness. Work on forgiveness. Forgiveness. One of the red flags that we're holding on to something that we need to forgive is impatience. I mm -hmm. really want to point this out that sometimes when we get impatient about something, uh huh, we get here, come, come on, come on, impatient. We want it to happen right now. We don't like the way it's happening. We don't like something's going on. We get impatient about it. We don't like what you're doing right now. We want to, be, we get really frustrated. We get upset about it. Hello. It's time for us to think maybe there's something I need to forgive to release and let go for me to be more patient with this experience and with one another. Because this is so important, unless we have engaged in the true essence of forgiveness, we find our life clogged and the flow of the divine love is in that way. You know, we've got to clean up the pipes. Years ago, I lived in Kenya. And in Kenya, the African bathrooms were designed in the homes where you have a beautiful bathtub, you have a little drain, but the drain goes right out the window, and it's quite often an open pipe, and it just pours out into a trough, and the water goes along uh, down into the road somewhere. So quite often, you might walk around the house, oh, you're having a bath because I can see the water pouring out. Or you're doing laundry, oh, there goes the laundry soap. Oh, well, you're doing dishes, I see the water flowing out. So 
Sometimes the little screen that would be put over the end of the pipe would get washed away, and it would be an open access. And you go to take a bath, and you look down, and you're ready to put that little fork in the drain, and there's... And you look down, and there's... Ooh, what is... It's a little snake. A snake in your drain. A snake has crawled into the darkness of the pipe where it's nice and damp, and that snake is in your tub. Not so crazy about getting in a tub in those moments. Even if I've got a cork on there, I'm not that crazy. I want to make sure that that snake is out of my pipe because it's clogging everything in the flow. And how true that is in our spiritual life. When we've not really done a check-in on the issues of unforgiveness, it clogs up the pipe and that wonderful flow of the divine that wants to come in, go out, that wants to work up and down this wonderful channel within our life becomes hindered. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and tenderhearted one, uh, to one another, forgiving each other as God has forgiven you. Forgiving in this way that, you know, God holds no grudges. God is always forgiving. God is ever loving. Love does not know the opposites. Love just only knows love. And that's the beautiful thing about God, that God is this wonderful essence of divine love, always will be and always has. And so when we understand that that's the example for our lives, the, the challenge for us is to learn this kindness that's coupled with tenderheartedness that has enabled us to be forgiving and to cleanse, to allow this pipe to flow freely within our lives. So would you join me within this, with this affirmation prayer? And repeat after me. I now, I, excuse me, I know that unforgiveness can be a snare. I know that unforgiveness can be a snare. So I welcome the presence, showing me the place in my heart where unforgiveness lies. Right now, I am receiving the grace to forgive others as God has forgiven me. How beautiful that is as we work on these spiritual practices within our life. We understand it is so important. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another because we are the revelations of God. That's what the text is inviting us. That's what the scripture is calling us to. That's the invitation of this spiritual truth that is ageless, timeless, that creates this transformation within our life, that enables us to be the new creature that we're called to be, that enables us to claim a new name, a new name. I may have been known as crabby, irritable, short, curt. Mm -hmm. Not Curtis, but Kurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, we may have known by all these different names, and then we welcome this transformation of spiritual growth within us, and we have a new name, and that name is love. Hello, love. Hello, love. That's right. That's what we begin to embrace within our lives. First John 4, 12 says, no one has ever seen God, but, I like that, but if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love has made us complete. It's perfected within us. It's honed within us. We become the master of it. If we love one another. You want to know how to really become a master? We start just practicing loving one another. Doing something loving. Doing something kind. Doing something sweet. Doing something, acts of kindness, random acts of kindness. This last week, Robert and I were just overwhelmed by the wonderful spirit of kindness coming our way. It was so beautiful. We had neighbors who brought us cookies at Valentine's Day, just homemade goodies that were yummy, just fantastic, and cards. And someone brought Robert's favorite magazines of interior design that he loves. They brought them, uh, knocked on the door, said, here, these things are for you. Another neighbor says, I was having trouble. I needed to move a chest of furniture, one of those big old antiques that Robert has downstairs to the main floor. I'll come and help you because there was no way I was going to lift it and no way Robert was going to help. So there was this, this challenge and here the neighbor man came in to help. I, I said, such kindness, such love. Someone else said, you know what? I see there's leaves and pine needles on your roof on the second story up there. I'm going to come by and blow your roof off for you. I'm going to bring the ladder. I'll bring it up there. I'll crawl up on top of the roof and I'll blow it off for you. 
wow. I said, this is amazing. Robert went out with some friends, and they went out for lunch, and someone picked up the tab. A stranger, someone we didn't even know, just said, I'm buying your lunch. Like, wow, isn't that amazing? Such kindness in the world. Those experiences were just so beautiful. I just said, love is here. Love is around us. Love is in us. Love is through us. And love is always for us. That's how beautiful it is. So if we love one another, there's a transformation that happens in us. A transformation. You now are the dwelling place of the divine. You're aware of that. You always have been. And now you're aware of it, that God dwells in me as I love. God dwells in me for God is love. And what I'm doing is expressing God. I'm expressing God through the kindness that I do. And when we do this, the world begins to see God. If we love one another, no one has seen God, but if we love one another, but if we love, they're going to see it. They're going to see that's God. That's the kindness. That's the grace. That's the mercy. And they'll see it. And what will happen in the process is our love will be complete, made perfected. You will be good at it. Amen.